So welcome everyone uh, back to our the second lesson in our fall virtual speaker series uh, with here with the Edmund Church of Christ. I am uh, Preston Watterson, your host for the series and for these online classes. And so we're glad that you're with us tonight. A couple of reminders real quick on how this works. Uh, we are live on Zoom tonight and we'll be live every, here every Wednesday night on Zoom. And so anybody is welcome to join us. We're also recording uh, these videos so that folks can watch them later. You can watch them as a class, watch them on your own. Uh, the first lesson is now recorded and posted on YouTube on our Edmund Church of Christ YouTube page if you weren't here with us last week. Uh, so whether you're joining us live tonight or whether you are watching this at a later date or listening in your free time, uh, we're glad that you're with us. We're glad that you're watching and we hope this series will be a blessing for you. So tonight uh, we are glad to have Dr. Brandon Tatum back with us continuing our series on faith formation in a secular age. I want to put a plug in for Brandon real quick here. I saw a, he can talk about this in a minute more, but I uh, saw a live um, chat that he had with the guys from the Barna Group. A lot of you may know them from UnChristian and, and some other books that they've written, but Brandon did a really good interview with them a couple days ago on Facebook with the National Christian School Association. So just a quick plug for that. Um, that's a good watch if you are enjoying the series and kind of the subject matter here. Um, okay, so uh, before we get started here, I'm going to ask Kent to lead us in a prayer, and then I will hand over the video feed to Brandon. Let's pray. Dear God, we uh, do recognize you as the one who made us, and, and since you made us, you know us as uh, no one else does. Father, we want to reflect you in this world. Thank you so much for the blessing of friends and family and church. Father, no matter what age we are, help us to be mindful of those of different ages. Uh, for those of us who are older, maybe we can remember some of being younger and, and the ways at times that we might have felt misunderstood. Help us to avoid the uh, thought that just because we were young once, we know how all young people feel. For these are different times, and, and just as our lives are lived in a different world than our parents before us lived, our children and grandchildren live different, live different lives in this world than we experience. But help us to remember enough to, to care. Help us to find great joy in understanding, not just being understood. So would you bless Brandon tonight and uh, as he presents your thoughts to us? But more than just Brandon, would you bless our ears as we listen? Help us to learn, to love, to understand. It's in Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you, Kent. All right. There we go. Over to you. All right. I'll share my screen. Thanks for the Barna um, plug there. Um, yeah, I enjoyed we are, it. We are doing some things with Barna, getting the opportunity to work with David Kinnaman on some things uh, for Generation Z students, uh, kind of across the country, specifically at Christian schools. Um, and so I'm excited about that. We're doing a three-part series uh, with Barna as we kind of roll some of that out. And so. Uh, uh, if you're interested in that, I can send that to you, or maybe Preston can send that to you. All right, so we got Faith Formation in a Secular Age, Part 2. So let me explain kind of what this week and next week are going to look like. This week, we're going to um, kind of tackle this idea that we might have a bad or a poor parenting theology right now in, um, in the space. And we're going to tease that out today. And then next week, we're going to talk about, okay, uh, what is a better parenting theology? What's a better way to kind of come at this uh, through a through a theological lens um, in working with our kids? But I kind of wanted to make some um, observations that I have seen over the past decade uh, with working with kids and working with parents and uh, how maybe uh, if we were to tackle our theology a little differently, uh, it might might come out with some different outcomes. And so, so tonight I want to talk about this idea of a Genesis 3 theology, which I'm going to call kind of a poor theology, uh, not, a, not a wrong theology, but an incomplete theology. And a Genesis 3 theology uh, really tells the biblical narrative like this. It, it, it says, Jesus created, or God created the world. God is the creator of all things. God created man and woman. 
and put them in a garden. And in that garden, Adam ate the apple and sin entered the world. And, and now we live in this broken and fallen world. But Jesus came uh, to save us from this broken world. Jesus came to uh, and died and was buried and he rose again so that, that one day we can have eternal life with him and kind of be saved from the brokenness. It, it, in a Genesis 3 theology, I, I don't think anything I said was unbiblical. I don't think anything I said was wrong. Um, but it really focuses in on the brokenness of the world. And, and as I started kind of thinking about this, I, I think about, I, I grew up in the church. My dad's a, a Church of Christ uh, preacher. Um, actually, my undergraduate degree is biblical text. And I kind of think through my, my childhood and even today when I, when I think of prayers that are offered at church or really anywhere. And most of our prayer life, which I, I think is symbolic of our theology in a lot of ways, that, that tends to be a, a theme in a lot of our prayers, right? Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for uh, saving us. Um, we, we tend to kind of come at it from this. Um, we're so thankful that you saved us from this brokenness. Okay, here's my point. When Genesis 3, when that is your, your driving parental theology, whether you would uh, articulate, it, articulate it that way or not, when Genesis 3 is your driving parental value, your theology, your driving parental value is protection. So statistically and in the aggregate, right, we live in this parenting phenomenon, really, in the last two decades, maybe a little bit more than that, uh, of this protection, where we want to protect our kids from the brokenness of this world. We want to make sure our kids are safe. And it's, it's not a bad thing to protect your kids. I think everybody on the call would say, uh, would probably report me if I said, I, I don't want to protect my kids. Like there is this sense that we need to protect our kids, obviously. But it's almost become like one of the number one things is parents, is this protection. So let me, let me get a little deeper on this. We shared these two, these two next two slides. I shared this last week about our kids and their psychological problems is of great concern at colleges. So we know there's this emotional. Um, I shared this with you, this idea of helicopter hovering parents, um, you know, that for a while they were calling parenting right now, especially in America, lawnmower parents. So it moved from helicopter to lawnmower because they're going to run over anything in our kids' way. Uh, now there's, I've, I've started to hear the term of this drone kind of parenting um, to where they can they can swoop in at any, at any time. They can even kind of come in under the radar and, then hit and kind of be hidden, but they're still there. Um, so there's all these kind of ideas, um, analogies, metaphors out there for parenting. But this is kind of an interesting, as we kind of go through some history here, and then we're not going to go back that far. Um, 1978, 1985, every state adopted a car seat law which car seat, seat belts are great. I wear mine all of the time. My kids, uh, if those of you that work at OCA that unload my children know that my kids are rear facing um, and they probably will be till they're 16 years old. Uh, and so, I mean, this is an important law, but it kind of goes into this protection of culture, like before this moment. Um, and many of you can tell stories of you know, riding, going on road trips in the floorboard and all kinds of crazy stories that y'all tell. Um, 1980, the abduction of Adam Walsh. Many of you will remember that, that hit national media. Um, I thought this 2014 statistic was interesting. Uh, there's only a 0.01% chance in America that a child is abducted in our country, 0.01%. But we parent as if there's a 50% chance my child, my child's going to get abducted if they play in the front yard, which is kind of an, an interesting shift uh, culturally for us. 
Um, in the 80s, we saw this heightened concern for children's self-esteem. Uh, in 83, we saw a lot of push and publications and different things for a lack of schoolwork. We saw on a countrywide scale that we were falling behind in education, primary education um, against other countries. And so there was this huge war push of we need to make sure our kids are doing a lot of stuff. And so we started throwing a lot of stuff their way um, in, the, in, in the 80s. So we started, this is when we were kind of raising up the millennial generation. Uh, 84, the play date emerged, which is, you know, that, that's interesting. We went from kids just going and playing in the front yard to kind of organizing our children's play. Um, 1990 was kind of the first use of the helicopter parenting idea. 94, uh, first bicycle helmet came out in 1994. So many of on, on this call learned to ride bikes with no helmet, which just blows me away as a, as a dad trying to teach his son to ride the bike right now. And I can actually one up the bicycle helmet because now they make a mechanism that you can install it on your child's bike and it's a remote for the parent to break the bike um, in case your kid starts going too fast. You can control his, his bike speed. I don't know how anybody learned to ride a bike before all these gadgets, you know. Uh, 2000, American Academy of Pediatrics released the policy on prohibiting specialization of sports. This is when the youth sports phenomenon really started um, taking shape in our country and, and became kind of a a key aspect of parenting in, in America um, was youth sports. Uh, I don't know how anybody parented before I-9 sports came into play or, 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 or you know, year-round travel basketball, but I think parents were able to do it. Um, there's some little sarcasm there. So, uh, you know, all of this has kind of created this scenario where our students are sheltered yet pressured our students are growing up too fast and too slow at the same time. Think about that for a little bit. This might, this, when I'm done with this slide, this might be a good one if you're watching the recording to pause this and talk through some of these dichotomies, but too fast and too slow. So they're being exposed to information much earlier in life through technology and different things, but emotionally and from a maturity perspective, maybe growing up too slow. It's a group that, that seeks justice, yet is very self-absorbed. So this is this, this internal battle of we feel the need to do good, but there's this self-absorption that is happening within this generation. They're high achieving, yet high maintenance, which is an interesting one. They are social, yet isolated which I don't think that surprises anybody with the, this technology phenomenon and social media and, and those things. They, they want to be connected. In fact, they are connected at all times, but there's still a lot of isolation in those connections. They're adventuresome yet fearful. Um, in, a, in, a, in a lot of cases, uh, risk adverse. Um, so I think these are interesting dichotomies if you wanted to, to push pause and talk about this as a class right now. I really like this. This is done by the Growing Leaders uh, Institute. So there are childhood messages that every child needs. Every child needs to know you are loved, you are unique, you have gifts, you are safe, you are valuable. Every, every kid needs to hear those five things. When they move into adolescence, and, and the question is often asked, what, you know, what are the, what's the age of adolescence? I think by age 12, every kid needs to have heard these five things. Life is difficult. You are not in control. You are not that important. You are going to die. Your life is not about you. And... Sometimes people laugh when they see that because it's some of those are harsh and kind of awkward. I think the fact that maybe some of those things make us uncomfortable, like you have to tell an adolescent kid they're going to die. Um, it, it kind of makes us uncomfortable. But, but think about this 
for, for, for a second. We know in those that are counselors and psychologists and even educators, like we know that when children do not get childhood messages, trauma occurs. We also know that when children get adolescent messages too early, trauma occurs, right? Like, like we know that there are five-year-olds that are going through things and maybe nobody's telling them one of these five things, but life is telling them one of these five things and trauma occurs. I would argue, however, that when adolescents don't get adolescent messages at age appropriate times, maybe they get these far later than expected, trauma occurs. It, it goes back to that idea that we talked about last week. There's an extinction of child likeness and extension of child ishness, right? Um, this is another one that, that, I, that I think um, your group could talk quite a bit about. Um, and th there are healthy ways to teach adolescent messages. Like I, I have a, a six-year-old and I think he's, he's probably heard in an age appropriate way, some of these five adolescent messages already. Um, you know, I mean, goldfish dies. He learned something about death in an age appropriate sense in that conversation. Um, I hope he understands he's not in control in our house. Um, and so it, it goes into how can we teach these things in age appropriate ways that don't cause trauma. But the bigger question is, are we being intentional when these things happen in a six year old, seven year old, eight year old, nine year old, 10 year old, 11 year old life? Are we using that to actually teach an adolescent message? Or are we doing more to protect our kids from these adolescent messages? And we're seeing the extension of childishness. And, and so it's really created these, these two dilemmas. Our children are overexposed to information far earlier than they're ready, but they're underexposed to real life experiences far later than they're ready. They're overexposed to information far earlier and underexposed to real life experiences far later. Uh, you, you might know this statistic. I don't know if I said it last week or not, but by the age of eight years old, most of our kids will have seen pornography. Um, through technology, a lot of it times it's accidental. Um, they're overexposed to information. They have it at their fingertips. Um, you know, a 14-year-old can Google anything. Well, I mean, not just 14, but you, know, you get the point. A kid can Google anything. Um, Google it is becoming kind of a normal expression in families. Well, go Google it or ask Alexa. Um, but they're underexposed to these real-life experiences, and they're underexposed to real-life experiences because we have protected them from real-life experiences. We have protected them in, in many in many ways from adversity and easy adversity. Which has led us to this kind of this happiness phenomenon in, in parenting. Um, this idea that one of my goals in parenting is that they, they be happy, like we want them to be happy. Um, and, and, and connected to happiness is this idea of of consumption, right? Like consumption is a huge piece. I mean, they have purchasing power in our market of billions of dollars, this group of kids. They have become markets for companies that they are intentional reaching um, because they are a market for business. Uh, this video kind of does a good job of kind of showing some of this. I am my car, I am my clothes, I 
am my bank account. I am my house. I obey my thirst. I have it my way. I just do it. I deserve a break today. I double my pleasure, double my fun. I live the high life because I'm worth it. I'm looking out for number one. I wait for nothing. I have a million choices. I get what I want. I do what's best for me. I spend my time where I want to spend it. No one wastes it but me. I have the world at my fingertips. If it doesn't work, I'll throw it out and get a new one. If I'm uncomfortable, I leave. There's some other place just down the street. If I'm unhappy, I'm missing something. I find it. I buy it. If I want it, I get it. I accumulate, I collect, I acquire, I take, I use, I devour, I consume. I am not the center of the universe, but I'm the center of mine. I want to know what's in it for me. I want to know what I get out of it. I'm here to find happiness. I live for comfort. I exist to be served. The world exists to serve me. I am the customer. The customer is king. I am king. Yeah, I love, I thought this billboard is kind of interesting. Zero to happy in one hour, Amazon Prime. Um, my, my wife likes that too. And we, we tend to get quite a few Amazon Prime videos or, or not videos, but boxes at our house. And uh, so, I mean, the, the, the idea here is obviously our kids are living in this, but we as parents, I, as a dad, uh, if I'm not intentional in thinking about it, I, we, we're unintentionally te teaching some of these things. Uh, James K.A. Smith, um, if you've read any of his work, um, it, it's fabulous. If you have not read any of James K.A. Smith's work, I strongly recommend you write that name down and buy his book tonight. And Amazon tells you that they can get it to you from zero to one hour. But uh, the book that I would recommend is a book called You Are What You Love by James K.A. Smith. And essentially what he's, what he's telling us is, or what he lays out, is this idea that culture is always cultivating us. Culture is always shaping us. And quite honestly, it happens in very unintentional ways, in ways that we don't even realize. He has a great example of, of the mall and, and, and how the mall is shaping the way we view the world, and we don't even realize it's viewing the way we shape the world. And so unintentionally, we, we are teaching our kids something about life by our actions. And the question that 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 Jamie proposes, which I think is rather interesting. We, we actually have a podcast with Jamie talking about this. If you're interested in it, it's, it's an interesting conversation. But the question that he poses is, okay, if culture 24-7 is shaping our, our thoughts and, and our concepts about life and about the world and about how we live in it, what are we doing from a Christian perspective in counterbalancing that? How often in our, in our Christian rhythms, he calls them liturgies, but in our rhythms of life, are we counteracting what culture is doing in their shaping? And I think that's a very interesting thought for parents and for churches. How are we counteracting the amount of formation, and you could even call it spiritual formation, even though... Um, you, you know what I mean there, um, that is happening in the world. How, how are, what are we doing intentionally? And that has really got me thinking as a parent, like what, what am I doing on an intentional level with my children to shape them from a faith perspective? I thought this was a good conversation. Here's the thing about Diet Coke. It's delicious. It makes me feel good. Life is short. If you want to live in a yurt, yurt it up. If you want to run a marathon, I mean, that sounds super hard, but okay. I mean, just do you, whatever that is. And if you're in the mood for a Diet Coke, have a Diet Coke. Diet Coke. Because I can. Yeah, just this, do, it's kind of that Nike, uh, Nike commercial, just do it, you know, but just, just do you. Just do you. Do what makes you happy. With, with the culture that we're living in, when we talk about this faith formation in a secular age, when the secular age 
is about your happiness, uh, there's, there's going to be some faith and some theological issues with that, right? But as we, as Christian parents who are also living in this and who are also being shaped by this, if we don't see it, it's going to cause some significant issues for our children. If as a church, we don't see it, it's going to have some significant issues for our youth and for our members. It's sometimes, you know, when you, when you live in the, the middle of something, you might not realize all of the implications. So if we're protecting our kids from adversity, if we're protecting them from real life challenges, if, if, if we're trying to create this environment to where from, from zero to 18, you get the happiest life that you can, free of expectations, free of really any responsibility, uh, are we stunting human development, the extension of childishness? And is that faith development? What, what are we doing in there to really be intentional? And I'm not talking about mission trips, and I'm not talking about church camps. Th those moments aren't enough to offset what's happening from a cultural perspective. Here, here's, the, here's the world that our kids and all of us are living in right now. Our kids' world is full of speed. And when your world is full of speed, the consequence to that or the outcome that, that a kid will develop is that slow is bad. Their world is full of convenience. And the consequence to a world being full of convenience is hard is bad. When a, our kid's world is full of entertainment, the consequence to this is boring is bad. When a kid's world is full of nurturing, the consequence to that is risk is bad. And when our kid's world is full of entitlement, the consequence to that is labor is bad. So, so what you're seeing right now, this is another moment, if you're watching the recording, to pause this and talk about this as a class. But this is uh, from Tim Elmore. Um, and I, I love uh, this, as he calls it, the scene narrative. Because I, I fully agree that that is our kids' world. Speed, convenience, entertainment, nurturement, and entitlement. And I fully believe that that world is not the world that a 15-year-old grew up in three or four decades ago. Uh, but this is the world today. This is what they're living in. And there's consequences to that. And again, if as parents and as churches, we don't recognize what world they're living in and we don't work to counterbalance that world, these are the consequences that we're gonna live with. And as we look at, again, stereotype aggregate data, as we look at outcomes that we've kind of talked about, we're seeing this extension of childlikeness and we're seeing Slow is bad, hard is bad, boring is bad, risk is bad, labor is bad. And, and I don't know about you, but there have been times in my marriage where it has been hard and boring. <laughs> um, there has been times in work where it's been hard and boring and slow. Um, there has been times in my life where I needed to take a little risk because it was good. Um, and so again, how do we counter, how do we counterbalance that? This is a really good discussion point, um, uh, for a group right now. If we were in class, we would spend some time kind of discussing this, this slide. Okay. How can we help kids see our, uh, the big picture? This is, uh, this is what, how, how can we help kids kind of see beyond the world that they're in, the, the speed and the convenience and the entitlement. This is just a little, um, some practical things that, that I've seen, but uh, I think children need to travel. 
And the last point there is you don't have to go to Guatemala to see this. You don't, you don't have to go to third world countries. There are, there are places in Edmond and in Oklahoma City that our children need to see and to experience and to engage with the people, uh, especially right now when we talk about diversity and inclusion and equity and race, like we as adults need to go see other people, <laughs> other aspects of culture, other places. We, we, we need to be spending time in, in some places in helping in understanding in conversations. Our, our children really need that. Um, our children need to see us using our financial capital to meet the needs of others. Uh, if, if we're in a place and we're blessed as a family, uh, how, how can our kids play into that generosity? How can they see some of that? Um, a global view helps our children know the difference between the temporal and the eternal. I think really finding strategic ways to think about some of these things. I, I knew a family um, when I was living in Austin, that uh, every family vacation they went on, they made service an aspect of it. And in a lot of ways, it was not planned service. Um, so it wasn't they set up a, 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 you know, a time to go to a food bank in a different city or, or something like that. It was they were going to be intentionally looking for people on their trip that needed help, and they were going to help. Because they knew, like myself, that when we go every day and just go through our normal routines, we pass people on the road that need our help and we don't even see it. And so that was part of their, their vacations. They were, they were pausing from um, everything they did at home. They were going to make that a, a part of their, their time together. I know of families, I know of a dad that three times a year goes and takes his kids um, they're, they're upper elementary and there's safe ways to do this. Talk about the protection thing. There are, there are some safeguards that need to be put in place or something like this, but they go spend the night in downtown Austin, Texas three times a year and they take the city bus and they go, uh, there's a, there's a church that lets homeless people sleep in the parking lot. So that's where they sleep. Uh, but that's a different uh, way to just to see the world, to view the world that I think is a very intentional thing that he's doing with his, with his children. C.S. Lewis, um, this is a quote from C.S. Lewis, and it's not a quote in any of his books, actually. This is a quote from one of his sermons. I found it in somebody else's book as they kind of talked about this quote, and I've kind of taken this quote and, and added to it a little bit. So if you don't like what I'm about to say, uh, it's, it's you don't like what Brandon Tatum's saying. It's not you don't like what C.S. Lewis is saying because he's much smarter than I. But C.S. Lewis says you can only get first things first by putting second things second. And I really like this quote at, at a lot of different levels. And, and, and as I was thinking about this quote, I kind of came up with this little, this cute little thing here. I, I don't know if it's cute or not, but I think there are first things in life, and I think there are second things in life. And I think we could all somewhat agree on what the first things are. I think if we got into a room and we started listing first things, I think we could all agree on them for the most part. You know, I think faith is a first thing. I think Jesus, his death, burial, and resurrection is a first thing. I think the Bible is a first thing. I think character traits can be first things, that, that we're trustworthy, that we're responsible. Um, I think there are a lot of first things in life. And then I think there are second things in life. And second things are not bad things. They're just second things. So I think in this, this world, usually when I, when I offer this up to a class or a group, that the two first second things that people mention are academics. It's a second thing for kids. And athletics, extracurriculars, fine arts are second things for our kids. I think we agree on these. They're not bad things. They're just second things. 
But here's what I've started kind of seeing from a cultural perspective. What we have told ourselves is that second things produce first things. So, so think about that for a second. We, we say things like athletics produces character or, or academics produces, you know, these character traits. And so we say second things produce first things. We might not say them in those ways, um, but, but we somewhat believe this idea. And, and I mean, I, and I believe, I mean, I, I was a coach and I was also an administrator at a school and th there are aspects of academics that produce character traits and there are aspects of athletics that produce hard work and responsibility. I, I, I agree with that. But what, was, what has happened is we have spent so much time in second things. We, we, even, we even unintentionally, again, remember my, my, some of my key words tonight have been intentional and unintentional. And unintentionally, we reward second things with our kids. Um, I just got a, this is from years ago. Um, from different schools that I've worked at or just different places that I see on Facebook. Uh, this was one a family had an opportunity to, to um, put in a, in a little blurb what they were proud of for their kid, a Christian family. Mom and dad are so proud of you for being a three, three sport starter. That, that, that's what they, they put in there. And, and I look at that and it breaks my heart because that's telling the kids something of what their parents value. And I don't think mom and dad thought anything about it. I, I don't think mom and dad thought anything deep about it, or, or I don't think they're bad for doing this. It just to an image of where our culture is. Uh, you know, Facebook posts, beautiful morning for a cross country meet. We finished this, we're 16, seventh grade, girls one second, uh, who knew she could run so fast? Very proud of both our speedy girls and excited for the season. There's nothing wrong with that post, but it's all second thing focused. Uh, congratulations. My son was named to second team all Edmund football as, as a tight end. Nothing wrong with this. Uh, our oldest grandson plays top 10 golf tournament today. Nothing wrong with this. My child is on the honor roll. Nothing inherently wrong with these things. I like this one. My child beat up your honor roll student. I've next actually never seen that on a car, but I thought that was kind of funny. Uh, or, or, you know, we have these little league teams and there's nothing wrong with this, but they're getting these world series rings at the little league level. Like that's not a, a world series ring. That's a world series ring right there. Um, it's just interesting to me. And there, again, there's nothing bad with these statements, but unintentionally, we spend so much time in the second things, doing the second things, praising the second things, that we, there are some, some deeper rooted things happening. So, so uh, even the questions we ask after our kids play games, you know, how many points did you score? It's like the first question we ask after a basketball game. How many points did you score? You know, instead of, hey, how, what kind of teammate were you? Or did you honor God in your, in your game today? Like we don't, we don't think about those things. It just, this is just kind of what comes out of our mouths. Not that that's a bad question to ask. So, so let's get a little deeper in here. So I, there's first things in life. There's second things in life. We say second things produce first things. Athletics produces character. Academics produces character. But here's what I'm afraid is happening. We have spent so much time in the second things that they have moved us into first things, and the first things have become second things. And we see this a lot. Like we, we push our kids so much in academics that they begin to cheat some. Or we, we push our kids so much in athletics that there's some character things that, that start, start happening, right? And, and, and we don't, we don't, we wouldn't say it like this. We wouldn't articulate it like this, but unintentionally this is happening in our culture and our churches and our Christian homes. And I am convinced after working with so many kids that what we have done unintentionally is created second thing identities. 
our children do not have in the aggregate first thing identities. They have second thing identities. Um, I, I was visiting about this with a, a friend of ours, uh, of Megan and ours, who is doing her fellowship right now. And I just said, hey, what do you kind of think about this idea? She doesn't have kids. And she said, oh, 100%. 100%. I was a valedictorian at my high school, and I went to college, and my identity was I was the smart kid. And I got to college and had a complete meltdown because I realized I wasn't the smartest kid. Her identity wasn't in, grounded in the right place. Um, I, I, you know, I go to college and I am the baseball player. I am the basketball player. I am first chair. I am. And, and you realize I'm, I'm not the best. I'm not. And so our kids, they're going into to college for a lot of them or going into the workforce and, and, and they're struggling with who they are. They're having this, this crisis because we didn't raise first thing people and we didn't even know what was happening. We thought we were doing the right thing. We, we were, we were using the second things to produce the first things. I love this quote by George Barna. By the way, this quote from George Barna, we talked about Barna Group early on. I forgot, I forgot this quote was in here. This quote was actually done in the mid-90s in one of George Barna's first books. But he says this, we can strive to give our youngsters all the advantages our world has to offer and to motivate them to make the most of available opportunities and resources. But unless their spiritual life is prioritized and nurtured, they will miss out on much of the meaning, purpose, and joy of life. I don't know if you remember, but last week we said only 16% of, of 18 to 25 year olds could articulate their purpose in life, their meaning and purpose in life. There, there's some connection points here. We're going to go a little deeper into that next week as we talk about a better theology. Um, but I think, I think George Barna is on to something here. Here are some, just some, uh, over the years, I have screenshotted just some really good posts from parents on Facebook and different things. I love this one. Pray, proud of Haley Marie. She has a natural athletic ability, but I've told her many times that that is not the only reason why I enjoy watching her play. It's her attitude and her work ethic. It's that she's coachable and a team player. Excited to see her play high school sports next year. Like this tells... Haley, something about what her parent values. Yep, second things are great, but I really value the first things that I'm seeing. Um, in the car on the way to school in the morning, Mason and I say a little pep talk. One of the lines is, I will love others. This morning, this morning Mason added, I will love others just the way they are. I, I love that intentional rhythm every day on the way to school. So proud of this guy. Add homecoming king to his accomplishments, first thing. But you have a heart bigger than Texas and always love on everyone with a smile that never ends. I love you so much. I, I, I want to recognize second things because I'm really proud that you're a homecoming king. But here's the deal. This first thing, the way you love people, I, I value that, son. I, I love that. Surrounding our kids with Christian influences is central to good. It's, it's certainly good. Christian music, Sunday school, youth groups, etc. But it is no substitute for training. Training is a conscious, active effort of instruction, discipline, and modeling, and not a byproduct of a good environment or a loving home. Consider that no wild horse was ever broken or trained by being grouped together with trained horses. I love that quote. We, we could put our kids in all of the right places. We could put our kids with all of the right people. But without intentionality, culture is going to win. Culture is going to create these, these rhythmic liturgies 
that that will overtake. And so as families, again, I ask, are we being intentional? So, some would say, I, I, the, the guy that actually, uh, Reb Bradley wrote this quote, but this quote was actually found in a book called Running with Horses, done by uh, Dr. Larry Taylor, president of a Christian school in Texas. Um, and, and what Dr. Larry Taylor would say is that as families, are we creating family plans? Like, like as, as, as business leaders, as business owners, as, as people in the workplace, like we have organizational plans, we have strategic plans, we have all these plans, but do we have something for our families and, and is it intentional and is it, and are we holding ourselves accountable to it? If it's important for the workplace, why would that not be important for my family? Um, to be in this Deuteronomy 6 narrative where it's 24 seven, when we walk along the road, when we sit at home, when we get up, when we lie down. It's interesting thoughts. So again, this Genesis three theology is centered in protection. It's centered in making sure our kids are happy. We don't want them to, to feel the brokenness. We want them to be protected from the brokenness and we want them to be happy inside that brokenness, I'm not sure is a complete theology. And next week, we're going to talk about a Genesis 1 theology that, that is a little bit more complete. I do have discussion questions. Looks like we're at about that time that, I'll, that I want you to walk through. I want to mention, I want to say something about question number six. Um, I want to provide some context to that statement. I don't want to necessarily answer it for you, but I think Paul talks a lot about adversity, struggles, and difficulties in the New Testament. Um, it's this, it's not a new idea, but kind of a popular idea in, in pop literature and research right now of the word grit and, and how we need to be developing grit. In fact, Barna, um, David Kinnaman, and Mark Matlock in Faith for Exile say that we have to create a resilient faith in our children resilience and grit are hot words right now, um, both in the faith space and outside of the faith space. And, and I think Paul uses the term grit a lot in, in the text and how we have to develop this in our kids. And the only way we can develop grit or resilience in our kids is to let them live through and work through adversity. Um, in fact, I think, um, that the fruit of the spirit, some translations use the word patience. Some use the word long withstanding. Um, I, I think patience is probably a poor um, translation of that word because really what Paul's saying in that word, in that Greek word is this long withstanding. It's this over a long period of time, are you able to work and wait through adversity for what's to be, right? Are you able to live through the persecution because you know what, what is out there? It's, it's, the, it's the grit, it's the resilience, is the, it's the withstanding great adversity to, with, 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 to withstand this or to, to look beyond this moment. And so I, I think the New Testament speaks a lot to that. So I just wanted to throw that out there. But here are questions. I think Preston is going to um, leave this up for you to walk through. Again, next week, we're going to go through kind of a more uh, complete theology and what that can look like and how that can play out both in our churches and in our families. Thank you all very much. All right. Thanks, Brandon. And, and a lot of rich material here. I'm going to have to go back and watch this one three or four times, I think as a father of a teenage, teenage and preteen kids. So really appreciate all that and the, the dichotomies and the intentionality and the, the concept of second things. I just love it. So really appreciate all the thoughts there. Thanks, um, thanks everybody for being with us tonight. Thanks again, Brandon. We'll be here again next week at 7 p.m. on this line and uh, everybody's welcome back. All right, thanks Preston. Mm -hmm.